hi, my name is Bonnie Brady. I'm the executive director of the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. And we are here now with the Q&A for the Hampton Dock Fest winner of the Andrew Sabin Family Foundation Environmental Award, Fish and Men, that was directed and produced by Darby Duffin and Adam Jones, along with Heidi Zimmerman as producer. And thank you very much for this opportunity. So thank you both for taking the opportunity to be here today. I have a ton of questions, but perhaps you want to tell uh, the audience a little bit about yourselves first, and then I'll hit you with everything I have. And it was great to see your movie mm -hmm. in advance. Um, I know every fisherman that's there and most of the other speakers that were involved. I, I see them frequently when we're not in COVID at fisheries meetings. So it was really great to me that you got a really good snapshot of the industry as it really exists. So um, Darby, I'll start with you. Sure, thanks Bonnie. Um, my name is Darby Duffin and I'm the co-director, co-producer of Fish and Men. And Adam? Um, Adam Jones, also co-director, co-producer of Fish and Men and we're uh, thrilled to be here at the Hamptons Dock Fest. Yeah, well, it's a, a really exciting uh, ability to be able to speak with you also. I know that you all obviously must be pretty excited by winning the Andrew Sabin Family Foundation Environmental Award. We all on the East End know Mr. Sabin quite well, so that's quite an honor. Congratulations. Thanks, and I'll, yeah, ju I'll just honor. say thank, thank you. Uh, thank you to the Hamptons Dock Fest for selecting our film, and uh, we're thrilled to receive the Andrew Sabin Family Foundation Environmental Award. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, let's see, we'll just jump right into it then. I, uh, <clears throat> I know this film was done a couple of years ago, and uh, I guess I wanted to, my first question I had was, uh, what began your interest in doing a film about U.S. seafood and seafood in general? Sure. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I'll, I'll take that because uh, this, this started really as an idea about 10 years ago. Um, I was living in a coastal town in New England, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I happened to get to know a few people that worked in the commercial fishing industry. Um, a woman by the name of Patty Anderson, you might even know her, uh, Bonnie. Um, or her and I had gotten to talk and gotten to know one another, and I, I began to realize uh, just how dire the situation was, at least for fishermen in New England Absolutely. and um, along the coast of New Hampshire and in, in Gloucester as well. So um, it just became something that was you know, surprising to me because it didn't seem like that was well known at the time. You know, you just, if you lived on the coast, you assumed that all was well and that fishing, um, particularly in the commercial fishing, fishing industry. Um, and then it wasn't until I actually visited a local seafood market um, in Portsmouth and I was looking for local seafood, you know. So, um, but I couldn't find it. You know, I mean, right. literally behind the glass case was everything but local seafood. There was cod from Norway. There was cod from um, Iceland, but there wasn't cod from local uh, fishermen. Uh, and, and I mean, you could literally see the boats from behind, you know, outside the window. Right. We was on the water. And, um, you know, if, if you did happen to come upon local seafood, it was more expensive. So it just, you know, I remember asking the guy behind the counter and he just sort of shrugged his shoulders and I knew it was like a, a, a question I posed that he couldn't answer. So that's kind of how it started is just sort of a, a curiosity. And, um, you know, so I started reading a lot and, and I did some pro bono work with um, Patty's organization. And then um, it was a couple years later where um, there was a documentary film contest came up, a pitch contest. And I had a few different ideas. Um, I, I put them to my, my um, excuse me, my mom and my wife. And they were both like, do the fishing one, do the fishing one, you know, absolutely. So, you know, I put together a treatment, a pitch. It did very well. It sort of served as a proof of concept that I, you know, this was an interesting story. It was sort of like Deadliest Catch Meets Food Inc. It was, you know, the iconic American fisherman. Right. Um, at the same time, where is our seafood coming from? You don't know. And that was sort of the premise of it. Um, so, you know, but it was a big daunting project. Um, I had never made a doc before. Um, and, you know, so I, I was, 
I was determined to uh, find somebody dumb enough to go along this journey with me and Adam <laughs> thankfully agreed. So, you know, we were both kind of fools for, you know, jumping into this, but you know, I remember talking, you know, I'd known Adam for a long time. I called you him up. I knew he, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, he, you know, he, he um, I remember we had lunch and, you know, I pitched him the idea and he was curious. And, and at the end of the hour, he was like, we have to start shooting this like tomorrow, you know? So thankfully he was, he was as, um, uh, as into the idea as I was. And uh, that's kind of how it started. And that was about six years ago. Oh. Oh. Seven, sorry, seven, right? 2013. Yeah. So Adam, what about you? When you heard this story, what did you think as you were having your lunch? I mean, <laughs> As a as a filmmaker, it wasn't like I was like really searching for like some passionate reason to research seafood, and this just connected these magical wires for me. I mean, I eat it, but I don't cook it, and I don't fish. Um, I think it was just simply a, one of those great ideas where I was like, how how can nobody have done this? I work in advertising for my day job, so it's a lot about concepts, a lot about like strategy, a lot, of, and, and this had all of that, you know what I mean? And so I just, uh, we, you know, we looked at the landscape real quick to see what other films out there have been made about this content, and what we found was that there's a lot of stories out there, as you may know, especially, but a lot on the like regional and local level right. about this, about Gloucester, and you, and you, like you had mentioned in your introduction, you see the same characters come up over and over. Right. But I think Darby and I um, started out on sort of an idealistic quest to, um, you know, at first sort of dive into the to the story arc of, of what was going on in, in Gloucester with the most iconic fishing town in America, 400 years of history. Um, everybody's seen the perfect storm. Everybody's eaten Gordon's fish sticks. And like these were, you know, culturally what what I knew right. of it, you, you know, and I lived in New England my whole life. Um, so. I don't live there anymore. We've both moved houses twice during the shooting of this. That's how long it's been. But um, so, so I think it was, it was just an interesting journey to sort of go from that sort of springboard that was the beating heart of the story being the fishermen themselves and really get, get to let them tell us what's going on with their voice, but then to blow it out from there and sort of look at all of these different angles and lenses and characters and stewards and, um, there's a lot of a lot of conflicting ideologies, as you know, um, and I think you know our approach the whole time was to really try to just let the different voices speak their side of the issue, and the hard part was putting it together in a way that is a digestible 85 minutes of film, but to, to not really be an advocacy film. We, we really tried to not do that, um, and so. This is sort we of where we wound advocate, up. We let the people advocate for themselves and put the positions out there. <clears throat> Darby, I'm curious, how did you go? Was Pat, did Pat help you get the names of people that were important within, or how did you find the people to cast in cast in this uh, documentary? Yeah, no, she didn't. Actually, it was uh, it was just through research. You know, I'd read a lot, and uh, so the same names you know, continue would pop up. And right. uh, these were folks that were, you know, opinionated and not, not afraid to share those opinions. So um, that's how uh, it, you know, I came across both Russell and Richard. Um, I had to do a little digging to get their information. And I, I just cold called them. And frankly, I was expecting them to be like, you know, uh, you gotta be, yeah, you gotta be <laughs> effing kidding me. I'm going to do a documentary with you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you're just aware that these guys, uh, have been burned. They, um, are, they've, they've seen media reports where, you know, they'll be interviewed by reporters. And then of course the perspective is much different than the tone they get from, you know, right. during the interview. So, you know, they're savvy. They're aware that you're, um, you have, you wield a lot of control over mm -hmm. um, the story. And so they're naturally and understandably um, a little skeptical about, about that. But so, you know, thankfully, you know, I was able to, um, you know, not convince them, but, but um, uh, just, uh, I guess, was that? 
basically give them their own voice, let them portray themselves. And yeah, like, just uh, let them know, you know, or uh, I guess can just convince them of like the desire to be authentic and to share the story. I think that's the thing. They there's so many people there that just felt like you know their story hadn't been shared in a words way to that out of context. Yeah, in a in a way that um, had really portrayed them honestly. Right. So. Um, yeah. I, I just, I, I know from watching the film, there is one, I love what Russ Sherman refers to a bum like me. Russ is a Harvard grad, so it was just classic to and hear. you know that, right? A lot of people don't. In fact, uh, that that's one of those things about the, the folks in our film, you know, uh, Frank Marchi, you know, is a BC mm -hmm. grad and, and David, a BU grad. I mean, these are, a lot of these guys uh, sort of defy the stereotypes. Well, and, and that's, I think, a really important component is there is certain uh, a certain mindset sometimes among some people that think if you work with your hands that somehow your brain isn't attached to the final product and so showing a variety of fishermen that are also good fishermen and or college graduates or they never went to college but they're really good at their trade that matters i mean it's hard enough to just go out there day after day and not die but then to go out there day after day and bring fish back to the dock you know that's a that takes extra skill it's not and that they choose that right i mean that this is something they would they would russell would never want to be working behind a desk this is yeah. the life he wants this absolutely. is the life he chose and all, all of them so that it was a choice you know no absolutely um Adam, what do you think? Did you have any input as far as in bringing the people there? Were you uh, working hand in hand or what was your, did you have, a, did you all, I guess I should ask, did you all have specific roles within the film that you took? As you I, 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 I love process. I love process questions. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, I don't think Darby and I knew what we'd bitten off. Neither of us had made a feature documentary before. Neither of us had worked together before. Um, we didn't really have a game plan and uh, we had absolutely no plan for how we were going to ever edit this film when we started it that literally started about three years in which is something i always like to mention as a a, a thing that we learned what we'll never do again um but i just shoot. asked how long did it take because it flows in my perspective of course i might be slightly biased but it really flows seamlessly and i'm sure yeah. that's not how did you how long did it take to edit <laughs> well, if you were, if, so we went, we you went from five editor, five editors to find Heidi. Wow. And that from, from that moment where I said, we sort of, we were continuing to shoot, but when we started editing, we already had, I don't know, or somewhere around 250 hours of footage that was just sit in a pile of files with names that overlapped. It was an absolute mess from different dates, absolutely no organization on a hard drive. And so to take it from that point, we went through three or four editors, then landed on someone who did a first assembly. And from that first assembly, we, we found Heidi. And then we spent 24 months editing with straight, where I'm not full time, but like more than part time. Yeah. So, you know, we're, you're looking at years of- a Year of, and a half editing. at least, if you, right? If you condensed it together. Yeah. And, and it's, it was, it was, it was really a learning process. It was really hard because as you know, I mean, there's a lot of geography, a lot of science, a lot of different voices. I mean, we had close to 70 interviews in the can. I think about 24 made it into the film and every single one of those paths has to be explored and then abandoned because you have to decide that this one is, is, is more important. So yeah, it was um, the editing process. You know, the, the, the rule of thumb that was told to me and it act actually really proved true is that like if you have this amount of time and money, you're going to spend 20% of your money on shooting it. If you spend any more than that, you're in trouble because you're going to need 80% to, to, to spend on all the posts involved and to, to tell a story. Um, and this is, this is not one of those little intimate docs where we're following around like one character in their world. Right. This is, that, this is like that was the challenge i think we ended up with i don't know 300 350 hours of, of wow. footage 
something like that. So, I mean, you can do the math, you know, it's a small percentage of what you're, it's like sculpting, you know, when right. you're, you're whittling your way down, you know, making a, a recognizable shape until you get something that hopefully the nose is the right size and, you know, all the features fit together. But uh, I think the one of the most critical steps that uh, along that path of post-production was definitely the private screenings. We did a number of them. Uh, Adam was lucky or unlucky enough to be in person to uh, sort of, you know, take the uh, take the barrage of, of opinions that came with that. But um, it, it ultimately proved to be, you know, the the very necessary part of the process where, you know, you begin to lose perspective as filmmakers of what's important, what's not, especially as you're whittling it down, you get to there's a couple scenes that, you know, were tough to lose. So did you actually, you had different clips that you went out and screened first or different fuller versions or was the this assembly the final? When, yeah. Once we got to a rough cut stage. Okay. Um, we began, guy, that's one of my next out. questions actually is when did you realize that you had something special? When I, I can answer that. that. I can, I can tell you it happened on, on, on like this actual second day of shooting, which was the first day we started doing interviews first the first shoot was just the uh on the on the fish pier um but that was just a kind of run and gun thing that i found out last minute about but the actual we adam and i built a little schedule for a weekend and our first interview was with rich burgess that i could say was at the end of that interview and you know of course we we use a lot of that and i think those are some of the most hitting emotionally hitting scenes right. Um, when we walked out of that interview, we were, I think that was the first time we were like, wow, this is on. It's, that was powerful, you know. Right. And what about you, Adam? Was there anything particular that was at that interview or was it when you were starting to like see or draw those themes? How did, like, how was it cooking in your brain? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to tell almost the, the converse of, of the answer that you're looking for. I can tell you okay. what the darkest day was. And okay. it was um, when Darby and I in, in, in 2015 had like an assembly that we had worked on with one editor for two months. That was the extent of the cut that we had. It was 20 minutes longer than the current film, but it was basically still an assembly. But we thought we were ready to submit to festivals because this was our first go. And so I hosted, or actually my friend in Los Angeles brought all of these hardcore doc filmmakers, like like guys that do 30 for 30s and like they're way more successful than they're what you, what you dream of being. You're actually making a living doing documentaries and selling to big buyers. And they came in and he assembled them and we watched. And at the end, I just remember fe feeling so shattered with how far from done it was revealed that we were. And that was when we started to go to work. Um, and, it, and it was about 18 months after that, that we finally arrived at the cut that's close to what you see now. And so for, for that, that realization, having not gone through this long process before where we thought we were ready, even though we hadn't really screened it, to no, it's like you've just barely begun. And, uh, and dealing with that sort of resolve that it took to press on, you know, I was... We've had to pick each other up a few times during this, mm. this process. And, that and you have different... Time. You have different perspectives, of course, too, right? right? And so we we have to find a way to make that mesh together. I mean, I wasn't there in person, so for me, I heard what I heard uh, was a lot of the finer good points. You know, right. uh, yeah. Adam was there in person, and and you know, so he saw it and felt it a different way. I mean, I came out looking at you know the glass half full, and I can understand why he was looking at it a glass half empty kind of thing. But uh, there was a lot of work to do, and that, of course, was, yeah, we, we, we thought we were closer many times than when we actually were. And so, um, you know, ha now having gone through that process, I think we, you know, for future projects would have a better, clear understanding about, you know, how far that marathon is. And I guess the follow-up to that would be, and how did you know when it was perfect, when it was, this is it, we are golden, we're, here we go. Was there a point where after you'd gone through the cuts where you just, you sat and I mean, cause I know obviously if you're like living and breathing it every day, you can sometimes like anybody else get boggled in the details. Was it at a showing when you finally showed the final or a private showing or how did you know at that point that this was, this was really good, that you were, you had something you were super proud of and you couldn't wait to get it to humans. I think I we mean, all, I, I, I think ahead. we all came to it at the sort of a, at the same time, I think it was one of those 
final screenings. We were trying to get the film ready to premiere it. And, you know, uh, our editor said it, you know, her, her perspective, I think it's right is, you know, you know, you're done when you have no more notes. And I think we got to that place where, you know, we all looked at it, the three of us and said, I, I just don't, I don't think it, it can be any better. You know, I mean, and, and in the screening response sort of legitimized that point of view. Right. Right. Okay. I have a couple of other things here. Um, what were for each of you the top things that you both learned from researching and creating and as far as in the seafood industry in general were there any like shockers or was there any you know thing that you know one or two things that you really learned that you think were really important to get out in your film I mean, you may have the same things you may have different i'm not sure go ahead darby first uh, well I, I think the first all, you know, the 91% was the thing right away early on that was like, I just, it's just stunning, you know, so knowing, you know, when I, I know what my response was when I first learned that and knowing that most people did not know that, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, that was clear. This was going to be a big point of the film. And again, you know, we, we call it, you know, the tagline, the high cost of cheap fish. Most people just don't know where their seafood comes from and have right. no idea the amount of imported seafood we have is that coupled with the fact that only 1% of that's inspected. And then, oh, by the way, 50% of that 1% that's inspected is discarded. So that can give you an idea of like, wow, really? So this is what we're eating. We have no idea. And it's just powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, I think that for me was that in the food miles, how far food travels to get, you know, exactly. I mean, it, it's mind blowing the fact that you could catch a fish in the Barents Sea and ship it to China and then process it and come back and it's still cheaper that, you know. Or that they do it on the East Coast that. too. A fun fact, I, it, when the Sustainable Fisheries Act went into place in 96, we were at about 53% imports. That's required the 10 year timeline for every stock and every species of fish. Wow. So at the same time, you might have one, two, three species that all had, were in over fish. So you would have consecutive cuts. We used to call it death by a thousand cuts. After 20 years of the Sustainable Fisheries Act and further uh, quota restrictions, we went up to 91%. And tilapia, which was back in 20 years prior, a $55 million industry is a $1.3 billion industry. So people didn't stop eating fish, they just stopped eating ours. And that I thought you brought really clearly to the table. Um, what about you, Adam? What, what'd you learn? Or what um, <laughs> was the most interesting? I think, I think one of the things that we both had the preconceived, we, we didn't know until about I want to say four years into shooting, we didn't really discover the whole idea of dock to dish and where we were going to sort of settle in on our beacon of hope. And, and what dock to dish sort of represented, and it, it was, was a new pathway toward the culinary aspect to the idea that chefs can be the gatekeepers to the palate, the way that chefs can change the way people look at certain species of fish to the extent that it can create an entirely brand new fishery, which we talk about with the monkfish and, and Julia Child. So that sort of dovetails with the whole idea that, you know, something like 80% of the seafood that Americans eat are five species, and they're the same five species all the time. So that, to me, led to the big idea of flipping the demand from, from supply base from demand based to supply based and that's what dr dish sort of embodies so much and so yeah just just the idea of alternative species about you know eating what the ocean provides rather than what you demand from it is a new way of thinking that ultimately leads to us sort of indemnifying the viewer a little bit and saying look really the answer uh, it sits with with demand with consumer demand and I think that's what a lot of films who talk about conservation and advocacy leave out is if, is this very honest answer like the reason that we keep targeting cod is because that's what the people want to eat right and also a lot I think from what I've <clears throat> come to be because I may be somewhere in the middle age of both of you is People used to know how to prepare fish. They used to know how to gut fish, how to, how to cook it. They've, a lot have lost that ability. I mean, now that we've got, obviously, the internet, you could possibly go online, or then I was learning how to 
filet black sea bass. I actually did that this summer because I was like, well, is there a special way? Because I've eaten it whole before, but um, to try to get it done right. But it's a, people have kind of lost touch with their food. I think hopefully the entire COVID issue, not to bring that too much into this, but if there's nothing on the shelf, what do you do? And, and then what do you do to supplant your diet? So I'm hopeful that moving forward, people will pay a bit more attention to where their food is coming from. Um, I, I just want to say, in just a second, that point, I think that's a great point because, you know, there is no doubt that there's an intimidation factor with certain fish and particularly whole fish. You know, right. people don't want to get into that business. Uh, I don't, think. don't want to look at it. <laughs> right. And, you know, so I, I think if there were, this is an opportunity now and, and, and uh, I know it's done on maybe a smaller scale, but any opportunity for fishermen to connect directly with consumers, mm -hmm. with these community supported fisheries, with places, you know, uh, restaurant supported fishery like Dr. Dish and programs where they can offer some workshops to the public give them opportunities and you see that in our film at the school lunch program right where spencer montgomery is showing these kids you know how to yeah, play it and in it and it takes away that you know fear of intimidation like oh i can do this you know this is not going to be as hard as i thought it was so i i think if there were more touch points like that you would have you would encourage consumers to take a shot more at, at some of these fish yeah, no. Um, years ago, we won a Pride of New York Seafood Grant, the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association, and we were basically funded to promote New York landed fish at both restaurants and seafood shops to teach people basically what local meant. Because, you know, you walk into the store and unless it, you've got carte blanche, you check price. <laughs> and so, like, uh, I don't know, I think it was Adam, I'm not sure if it was you, Darby, we talked about it why does local fish cost more than something that is, you know, the tilapia at five ninety five? And so I think it was really important initially to put that out there so people did have other options. But I think that I actually, I know Sean Barrett quite well from Dr. Dish and I was with him when Bridgehampton, they did a food program where they were offering us cup sandwiches, um, what Sean likes to refer to as Montauk Sea Bream, and, um, you know, just introducing fish back into the meal uh, playbook for a lot of kids was huge because that's not something that a lot of kids, you know, know other than McDonald's, perhaps, you know, the filet mm -hmm. of fish. So, um, Adam, what about you? Anything that's particularly that as far as in, <clears throat> actually, no, I have one other question. I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around, but... Uh, what was each of yours favorite moment in the film and why Do you have a favorite either of you oh have i stumped Donald? <laughs> no I, uh, so many things <laughs> like uh oh, like a line or something I, I would say i, I will say go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah. okay um you, you you mentioned it actually earlier. It was, that was actually, maybe because it's fresh in my mind because you mentioned it, Bonnie, already, but that line where Rich says, a bum like me, when he talks about Archer Daniel and then Tyson, and he's up there, and he's like, Russ, yeah. Russ sorry, Russ. Who, who am I, who am I? And, and I remember, I love that line, in it, but it was, it, was a, it was a gold nugget that we found like after, I don't know how many cuts of the film. And there was, because one of the hardest things to do with this, and we use our character in the film, Barton Seaver, to mm -hmm. sort of guide us in and out of like, we're going back to Gloucester. Now we're going into the idea of bycatch. Now we got to talk to you about imports. Now we got to go back to Gloucester and check in there. And so Barton was this great sort of omniscient, uh, impartial, logical, grounded voice that helped us do that. And then, but this, finding that nugget was like this perfect tie-in that was, and it's such a, I, I like to think that one of the things I'm proud of because of how much work we put into finding nuggets like that is that even though we have a lot of talking heads in our film, that, that, the, that the voice is, in, is their own, you know, and that's the way Russ thinks and talks, you know, and so I just, that was, that was a big moment finding that gold nugget. It was somewhere that, like maybe within the past year. Yeah, that one, um, that just to give you some background on that because uh, it is kind of funny. Uh, we, Adam and I had one day at sea with Russell and it was about an 18 hour day. We left it, we got out of the dock at three in the morning, you know, um, and then we That's were off at four. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, not our normal schedule. But um, so I don't think I'd ever make it as a fisherman. But um, hmm. you know, we we shot obviously a lot, and it was just Adam and I and one other guy that we had hired who was kind of green. That you know, so it it was an interesting day. And, and an observer. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, there was an observer. That's right. So, but that that interview came I, at one point. Um, Adam and uh, I think his name was Ian got got sick and they were down below and this was sort of like midpoint of like the day. Like completely incapacitated. Yeah, completely. They were out like on the bunch. I, I just, after like two, I mean, Russell was just going in the wheelhouse talking and uh, I just kept like shooting him and taking out new, you know, cards and replacing with new cards and shooting. I mean, I think it was like a four hour interview. It just, it was like an all day kind of thing. So um, that piece that Adam referred to came out of that interview. I don't think that any of the editors had ever mined that interview. And of course it was years since, so I didn't remember every line, you know, right. obviously from that. And uh, Heidi thankfully had gone back through and, and, and watched that entire four hour interview that I shot with Russell in the wheelhouse. And that's, that's kind of how it came to be. And his story, I knew that he had been rescued once, but I had never heard the full story like he described it. I mean, that was, it was incredible, you know, I mean. That, and that, that, that uh, came up, there was, we, we started the film in three, four, five different ways. And um, the open um, in that way was uh, something that uh, was not the easiest thing to do, but I always, I had always felt it was a great way to introduce you right into the, mm -hmm into the world of the fishermen right. but the the challenge there was you know we just have russell talking about it and you know how are we gonna how are we going to bring to life rather than just having him explain it on screen uh so we you know that that was a bit of a challenge but i think it you know it worked uh, uh was that actually the responses footage? that we've got was that actual footage it was stock that was wow. treated yeah okay. It was, it was it, one of those moments, you, I think a lot of doc filmmakers run into it where you're stuck with like something like this, like a story or an anecdote. And you're like, well, one option is reenactment. Right. Mm. So, you know, yeah, that's a slippery slope to cheese. Um, but it can be done really well. It can be done uh, Oscar caliber, a uh, man on wire does it. But, but then it was kind of like, all right, well, we don't, you know, if you can't go out and shoot more, we're not going to get a helicopter over a boat or, you know, all these things. It's like, so just, yeah, it was like a lot of like gentle but like, I, infer inferences of what right. was going on. But, but I felt the clips that you did, they were in and around what could have been the time. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I, I really thought, oh, gee, they have footage. Wow. But yeah. You know, very even the hat you know even i still have my hat and the guy waving right. hat. i don't know right. where who found that but that was genius because it was uh adam or heidi but uh not you know so we were able to cobble it together to where the viewer might go i don't know maybe maybe this they had footage of that or something this you know? viewer thought wow oh my gosh you got, it. it was it was really but just quickly one of my one of my favorite and there, there's so many uh, but one of my favorite parts of it is just uh actually you know where where Barton is talking, and we're kind of at the low point of the fisherman's story. And you know he says, um, and and he's kind of adding voice, you know, third party validation to how they're fe feeling, and and says, you know, um, uh, which restoring their place with, to a place of honor, mm -hmm. you know, and and I, I I I think I felt personally that was something that I really hoped would happen with this film because I feel like that was something that had been missing and was missing culturally we, from this disconnect that we have with our fishermen that was this, you know, noble profession that they undertake to get food for us. And there should be a great amount of respect and, you know, so, you well, know, I one, just, of, I one actually, of many lines that I like. Both. I actually wrote that down again because I thought, you know, as much as we are trying to save the oceans, we are trying to save save people that give us access to provide us access to the ocean so that fishermen yeah. might regain a place in our society that they have rightfully earned which is a place of honor i love mm -hmm. that that was i yeah. mean i have not heard barton siever speak before I, i've read about him I, I know about him i know a lot of the people that were involved in many of those things but i found it 
very refreshing because having also worked in the service and the restaurant industry, not every chef really takes pride in knowing a lot about the variety of catch and also the background. Because I think like you were talking about what this movie really points to, you know, restaurants are about price point. That's a big to do. And I think someone on, one of the people on the film had said something about, well, I wrote this down too, about trash fish, not, uh, what was it? Hold on, sorry, I've got my notes. Trash here. fish. Trash fish becomes gosh, gas fish. fish. Yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> Even though if Sean heard me, he'd be really annoyed I used the word trash. He hates that word, I know. We, we've gotten into it with him about that. <laughs> right. But, but I think, you know, I mean, you've been in advertising. You know this. People, sometimes they don't, may not have the time. I mean, I think your film really takes a lot of information and compresses it into a really tasty, beautifully crafted package that can educate a lot of people, you know? And then part of that component isn't just looking for it in your restaurant where you can afford to have, try something new, but it's also trying something new yourself. And that means trying to find it in the grocery store. I know with COVID, I spent in March, I spent hours trying to speak with restaurant distributors because we had the fish, we had access to the fish, we had no markets. Rest supermarkets for the most part have completely removed their fish counters and having spoken to several buyers, if they go through on, and I mean all of Long Island, if they go wow. through one carton of fish a week, that's a big week for them, which is horrifying because this, you know, New York used to have filet houses everywhere. They used to have the ability to sell their fish. New York is one of the few states that can sell fishermen can sell their fish whole right off the dock but then the problem is if you've got a 45 pound striped bass that's a little big to hand off to someone mm -hmm. so trying to find ways that can consumers can not only be knowledgeable but also know where to go and or create those markets so that they can have better access we have no processing in new york it makes things very difficult as a uh, person that wants to be able to grow their markets if we are beholden only to fresh fish as delicious as fresh fish is don't get me wrong i think there's nothing better once you've had it you'll never go back but trying to find those new markets it's a huge deal and i think dr dish is a great venue for those that take part in it it's a matter of getting everybody in your average you know town in iowa to go okay what's that fish that's only a buck 99 give me that let me see what i can do so. Mm -hmm. well, well, speaking of flyover country, we, we, we thought about this a lot, making it in, and, and this could be one of the, the upsides perhaps to the new normal, is that how accustomed during these last eight, nine months, people have become to getting things delivered to their doorstep. And um, one thing we don't necessarily vilify in the film is freezing fish. It's really right. hard to transport it without freezing it once, preferably. Um, right. So. Uh, you know, to, to people watching this going, where can I get this stuff? But I live in Ohio. You know, the answer is Google it. Right. <laughs> I mean, there are so many little CSAs um, and little places that you can get it right from a guy's boat and all the information is right there and they send you what's sustainable and abundant at the time and it'll be there in two days and you can cook it at your house. And you might I even bet. come with a recipe. You know, New right. Hampshire well, Community Seafood actually... was another the doc dish program was planning on going live with that, but then UPS couldn't guarantee overnight. And so they had to put the brakes on the entire thing because they had mm. exactly that. And, you know, there's 30, 40 fishermen in Montauk that catch a variety of fish that were going to be the benefit of that. Hopefully when things get to back to some version of normalcy, it can move forward. But I think it's really important. Um, let me see what other, cause I don't want to be the, doing all the talking. Uh, I can just add to that on, yes. in the technology side of it as well is something that's pretty amazing. I know that, you know, uh, say Dr. Dish had their 2.0. I don't know where that stands now, but there's a lot of barcoding of fish and, and being able to have this fish track system where you can actually see where your fish was caught, who caught it, when it was caught. Uh, right. It's an amazing thing because it is the antidote to what the current problem is with our seafood supply chain that we have no idea where the seafood comes from we have no idea how many hands it, it went you know through so um the ability here in the u.s to do that i think gives the consumer a lot of peace of mind 
Well, I know, I believe Rhode Island had done a project where they were offering like a QR code, which was the same mm -hmm. thing where you go, you show up, you hit the menu and it'll show you that's the fish. It came from here at this place. Mm -hmm. I know at the fisherman level, though, there is a phrase, everything comes out of the cod end. So it depends, you know, fishermen, they do their vessel trip reports, they list all their species they caught, they bring it to dock, the dealer or the shipper in New York, because we box at sea and we transport into Hunts Point Market, they ship it and then it's sold on consignment the next day. And so at that point, when the dealer takes possession of it, they must within 24 hours send a report to the federal government saying I caught X, you know, I bought X amount of fish from Joe Blow Fisherman. So there really is a chain of custody from the Atlantic Ocean to the first fish buyer. And at that point, that's where things sometimes go, tend to go sideways. So I think that being able to educate consumers, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but look for the union label back in, I think, what was it, the late 70s, early 80s? talk about advertising. Um, that was something that I've been promoting. We did the, the uh, Pride of New York Sushi Food campaign in 2006, way before anybody was doing that kind of sustainability thing. And if people knew buy American fish or buy US fish or whatever, so that they knew and they had you know very clear markings and they would be able to push that in because literally right now as it exists and as you portrayed in your film, there is not much of a net benefit, sorry for the pun, um, to fishermen for doing the sustainable thing. And we are the only ones that are doing it. And as um, I forget, uh, Mr. Bullard mentioned, you know, if you buy it in the U.S., it's a U.S. landed fish, by the very law of Magnuson, it's sustainable. And I don't think enough people are aware of that. And trying to find those trash fish to cash fish so that everyone can benefit from what we've got out there in the ocean. So that there is that concept of bycatch because no one wants it is ridiculous we want we need to get past that somehow so i thought your film was mm -hmm. amazing yeah okay. we're so we're so we're so label and species conscious that if we i mean me personally how it's changed is is the only thing i want is fresh local fish i don't care what kind it is almost you know if they're Surprise. selling it you know <laughs> yeah then then i want it because right. uh and i think if we can get to that place right. you know as consumers where 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 that's what we're looking for oh absolutely freshness and, and, and I think using the chefs that are considered like any, like Patagonia toothfish, you know, the Chilean sea bass and everything, using a fish, mm -hmm. not necessarily that one, because that one got really hit, but using many species. I mean, whiting, king whiting is amazing, and hake, and I mean, there's so many. I know as the wife of a fisherman, I see some of that stuff and yeah. have to hear it. But these are all fish species that are easy to do but having the titans of the food industry start and having that kind of trickle down to the consumer is a great way to um put that forth and help it help it get to where it needs to be i mean the more access the more ways whether it's processing whether it's mobile you know driving to food deserts with a HACCP certified truck that you can fillet and sell you know, there's many different varieties of processing and someone wants to spend a whole lot of money just for kicks, come and get in touch with me because we've got tons of ideas. Um, I do have a, a last question because I think we may be close to the end. What's next for both of you after this? Um, obviously this reward is huge and that's, that's a really big deal. Um, the Andrew Saban Family Foundation Environmental Award. What's next for you all with this movie or what do you see for this movie? What would be your best scenario after this film what is it you'd like to see happen next would you have any further that you want to go into this or what what, what are you looking for yeah i mean I, I i could just come out and say like we're actively seeking a sales agent and distribution right now we've we've had some really good traction with um winning awards like this one which is you know a huge honor but there's actually we're, we've actually i think this is the sixth winner award that we've gotten so far oh, wow which one's only about only uh we premiered and we've gotten audience in new hampshire uh documentary in uh, uh what was it won the, the jury the, award at charlotte jury, at, festival at before charlotte this. Nice. new jersey shore so the fact that we're um you know so. i think every filmmaker's like starts out thinking you know sundance dreams um like i said our early on submissions were a little bit misguided so once you get past the top 10 festivals, 
you are in a situation where you just have to really kick some ass in the mid-level festivals to still get attention from prospective buyers. So now that we're kind of grind it out, uh, we've got to grind it out. And, and um, so the idea would be, you know, the best, the best case for any doc film is to, is to have somebody purchase exclusive broadcast rights, which usually comes with an upfront guarantee. So that would, that's the stories you hear about the films being bought at, 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 you know, Sundance for $2 million by Netflix. And I, and I think, while that's not probably in our future, um, the idea of exclusive rights in, say, Canada. Uh, we just, mm -hmm. we just had a really good uh, conversation with some broadcasters up there. So that's, that's sort of the pie in the sky would be a, a guarantee Netflix. with, with exclusive rights. But after that, then you just go into sort of a, a massive distribution plan. And, um, and, so and there's you know opportunity, any, uh, you know, beyond, um, the broadcast realm and, uh, digital online, you know, right now with, uh, theatrical even. So some of the docs that are coming out now because of the fact that, you know, Hollywood hasn't been filling AMC theaters with product, mm -hmm. there's a void. Um, it's giving docs opportunities now over the foreseeable future that some docs are are getting quite a bit of uh, theatrical run, at least yeah. where they can play. So, right. um, you know, that that's an interesting opportunity uh, as well. Coastal communities this winter, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I guarantee you, this would be something that would, would, would play, I think, quite well, at least for, you know, we've got a whole lot of people out here now that are on the coast, uh, more so because of COVID, people are, you know, moving into smaller communities. So it would be a, a great way to, uh, I know a couple of theaters, I guess. Spread the word. <laughs> um, anything else that you'd like to share about your experience making this or what, after it's done, what you think, um, I don't know, what do you think about the industry? What do you think about the fishing industry and the U.S. commercial fishing? Were you guys, were, but I'm assuming you did not know very much before you began this. No, um, we both certainly learned uh, a lot is an understatement um, on both sides of, you know, on the commercial fishing industry, but on all of those aspects and perspectives that, you know, we bring up in the film from the policy side and the environmental side and industry's point of view. So, um, you know, they're, they're valid points of view. Um, and is there anything I, shocking that you really were really like, whoa, that, that you were the most shocked about? Is there anything? I, I mean, beyond beyond the, uh, the the numbers, the sheer volume of of uh, imported seafood mm -hmm. um, in the food miles bit, I'd say it's the lack of inspection that I, I thought that was shocking. I mean, I I understand, you know, from a practical standpoint that with mm -hmm. all that seafood, you can only inspect so much, but to have it be right. so low. Yeah is, you know, in the fact that that just goes on, given the rate of, you know, failed inspections is, right. is a bit, is a bit troublesome, right. you know, it the, really yeah, is. Compared, compared to the USDA, I think for me, the, the most shocking thing was like, learning what bycatch was, I was like, oh, this is a word, this is a thing, and then when you realize that like, everybody should know what this word means, it's, right. it's the, the, the cost of it, and, and the waste of it it's just staggering throwing dollars overboard <laughs> yeah absolutely good food um there there's a there's a um uh, an interesting organization you you might have heard of it bonnie um in alaska uh i think it's in seattle the one that's, um, that's able to take share yes yeah, exactly. c share yes. That yeah, was I mean, that into the Magnuson Stevens Act specifically for the Western Pacific Fishery Management Council. We need a similar thing. Absolutely. Here so we could do the same because yeah. nothing makes fishermen more upset than having to toss perfectly good fish overboard. So, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I actually interviewed him uh, at the North American Seafood, uh, that industry. Expo, thanks, and in Boston, but you know that again was another rabbit hole that we we would have right. gotten lost down, and oh, so no, it's just it's... one of those those choices. But it, it you know is in conversationally, it's absolutely something that you know is critical to this multi pronged solution that needs to be taken on. And commercial fishing is one of those things. You think what's the big deal? You take a boat, you go out, and you catch fish. You bring them in. It's simple, right? And 
<laughs> the more you learn, the more you just, there's a zillion rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Adam, anything that particularly for you that was more shocking that I didn't already ask you about or something that you went, that's just not possible. Oh man, it just, I'm going, you just said a million rabbit holes. Like, I feel like that could be an alternate title to this film. <laughs> a rabbit holes. Just, it was, it was more like picking which rabbit hole to, to, to stay out of. Um, but well, no, one just, of the other things think, is, oh, sorry, go, Adam, go ahead. I was going to say the most shocking thing to me is what it takes to finish a documentary. I think at the end of the day, looking back in the, in the rear view mirror, um, you know, I, I, it's like, it's like having a child. It's like being in combat warfare. Like you just can't know it until you've gone through it. And it's really, really difficult. And I mean, I think Darby, like we're in the 85th percentile right now, just having a finished line, like finished a film. Like so many people start and never get done that you get done and you never get seen and you've never seen, you don't go to distribution. And so it's like, this is the first time, excuse me for interrupting. Sorry first time for a full length feature documentary that both of you have signed on to yeah 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 and this i don't know our... if we would have signed on to it if we had known it was going to take us seven <laughs> years if we had started this conversation that lunch that adam and i first had in 2013 <laughs> that it would be lunch lunch everybody's got to eat right exactly. there'd be a pandemic going on was we, the year we released the film but um yeah it's just it, it's a long road and well, uh, hopefully the next one isn't as long but i'm gonna um, just say for your first effort that's an amazing effort and i just want to say you. once again we're here at the hamptons doc fest with the winners of the andrew sabin family foundation environmental award darby duffin and adam jones the directors and producers along with heidi zimmerman of fish and men thank you very much i really appreciate this it was a great time thank you <laughs>